Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for another edition of Coffee and Hardtack, a digital interview program created by the Civil War Museum of Kenosha, Wisconsin. My name is Doug Dahman, and I'm the educational coordinator at the Civil War Museum. And joining us for today's edition is Dr. Susanna Earle from Southern Mississippi University. Uh, Dr. Earle, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Now, you're a professor of history and co-director of the Dale Center for the study of war and society at the University of Southern Myth. And you're also the author of numerous books, articles, editorials, blog posts, columns, and the list goes on. And um, you also do a lot of uh, digital projects sharing cutting edge historical ideas and research with scholars, educators, and the public. So I just wanted to get that out there. And, um, but the one thing that really, we were chatting before we started to record is, we at the museum just opened a new exhibit called Defending the Union, which looks at the immigrant experience in the Union Army. You wrote a book called The Harp and the Eagle. Um, and in your intro, you explained that you wrote it as a broad examination of the way Irish Catholic men and their communities understood their service in the Union Army. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that book and about your research um, and kind of how you came up with the idea to, to do that project? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So I started this project probably late 90s. Um, late 1990s is when I really started kind of dabbling in it. I'd written my master's thesis about a German American um, officer in the Union Army and I kind of started to kind of branch out with the immigrant experience. And one of the things I noticed in the literature was there was still a lot of almost kind of defensive reaction. Uh, you know, that the Irish Catholics were good citizens, darn it. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you how, and I'm going to show you what they did. Um, and I felt like one of the things we really needed in the field was something that would kind of tie those experiences together to understand broadly why they serve. That tends to be what I tend to research a lot in, in, in later books as well throughout my career, kind of military service, what motivates to serve, what keeps people in service or causes them to leave? How does it affect their families and communities? And when it came to Irish Catholics, there was kind of a, 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 an understanding within the field that I wanted to test. And that was that Irish Catholics really wanted to prove their loyalty, that the Civil War gave Irish Catholics um, North and South, but I focused on the North because that's where the majority of Irish Catholics lived in the 19th century US. And that as this group of um, within the population that was, you know, suffered under tremendous prejudice because they were Catholics, because they were immigrants, because they were poor, um, that, you know, they, they, they served to prove themselves. And I kept looking in the literature for that. And I think I only found one person, it was a sergeant by the name of Tully, who, who commented, you know, we could actually show people that, that we're, we're good and we're worth having here. But the vast majority of volunteers who I could find, either from their letters and diaries, um, through, in Irish American newspapers, in church records, the vast majority served for probably one of three re reasons. One, um, and this is the smallest percentage, they were Fenians, um, Irish nationalists who wanted to get some military experience that they can then take back and, and launch an Irish uh, rebellion for an independent Ireland. A much larger number inspire the title of the book, this, these kind of dual loyalties, right, to both the harp and the eagle, to Ireland and the United States, that, you know, as immigrants or children of immigrants, they really saw the United States as offering a tremendous opportunity uh, for them and for their families. As much as, you know, if you've ever heard that line, you know, that, that the immigrant comes over, they find out the streets aren't paved with gold, the streets aren't even paved, and I'm expected to pave them. Um, by no means was it the ideal but it still was better in many ways than what they had had to leave behind and that it was going to offer these opportunities. So you had to save the union. You had to preserve the union to continue these types of opportunities for future Irish uh, families and for the Irish in America. The last group that I think sometimes people forget because there's, there's, it's not particularly glorious um, is you're serving for the money. It was a way to, it's a risky way, but it was a way to make a living. Um, and you have your meals and you have housing and it's an incredibly risky way to do it. But particularly with those local and the state and the federal bounties, um, you, you could you could acquire a fair amount of money. And a lot of Irish immigrants in particular, poor working class Irishmen would would enlist for those reasons. So 
it's kind of a multitude of reasons that I found very rarely um, at the time was anybody saying it was, I'm going to prove my loyalty and then I will be accepted in America. It was after the war I found that Irish Catholics were saying we served, we proved our loyalty. You need to accept us and respect us. It was that, that didn't come until after the war though. Right. Well, how did their families react to this decision? Whether if they were, if they came with them and immigrated with them, or if their family members were back in Ireland, how, what was their reaction to, to this? Yeah, so if they're back in Ireland, this is this is gonna be a uh, kind of reaction, right? This kind of nervous, you, you, you're you doing what, you know? And and it's great that you're able to send some money home and, and that helps, but it was definitely le- less, I tended to see on average less enthusiasm. The person of your viewers, um, I think you've interviewed Dam- Damien Shields, or I know you've worked with him on, the, on that exhibit you mentioned. Damien Shields has done incredible work on kind of looking at the Irish, Irish experience in the American Civil War, um, particularly in Ireland. But in terms of the United States and their families, it really depended on the family. Uh, some families definitely supported it. You know, I, I found these great quotes <clears throat> in the newspapers as some of these Irish units, particularly the, the groups I tended to focus on were Irish dominated units, green flag units. Um, <clears throat> the area where I think we still need more work um, and, and people like Damien are getting into this, uh, Ryan Keating started getting into this, um, are the, these mixed units, right? Where you have a lot of Irish soldiers, but they're not necessarily in, in uh, immigrant units. But anyway, I would, I would find comments in newspapers like, <clears throat> rem- <clears throat> excuse me, remember your country. And I, I remember thinking at the time, well, wait, which country? Um, right. And it's, it's like, remember your country boy and keep up its credit or something like that. And, and you, you, so you see that pride, right? You see this opportunity um, for Irishmen to show um, kind of how brave they are. And I think that's where that myth really came from. Um, but but I, think, I think it was a mixed bag for their families. I mean, some of them, you know, there's a guy by the name of Peter Welsh um, who, it, it just depends on which letter you get into, but some of them are just kind of desperate to kind of get on, get on a kind of a straight job, if you will, and support the family. So it really depended. I'm fascinated by the, the talk uh, in your book also about how their service was linked to Irish independence. Where, where would that have taken place, this potential training ground? Where were they anticipating this battle, like, for, so to speak, to take place in Ireland, in North America? What were their goals behind all of that? So, the, so when you look at folks who are kind of active within the, within the Fenian organization, right? So Thomas Mahar, uh, Michael Corcoran, some of these kind of d- definitely dedicated Irish nationalists. The idea is, is that they're going to get experience and they're going to be able to take that experience back to Ireland. Um, there, there were engagements um, in Canada after the war, um, but the main idea is that there's going to be this rebellion and, and Ireland will be able to become an independent country. Um, but the thing to remember about this is you can find Irish Americans talking about this desire for an independent Ireland, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're Fenians. It, it's almost like this pride that develops um, that in some ways becomes more aggressive when they come to the United States as they're kind of trying to defend their background, defend where they're from. And, and embrace this kind of honorable um, heritage, if you will, like you see with a lot of different groups. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're all radical Fenians, that they're participating in some of the nationalist circles that you see in the Army of, of the Potomac and places like that. Um, there were Fenian circles, but it's, it's definitely never kind of the majority. Yeah. Now, our museum here in Kenosha really looked at the experience of the upper Midwest the seven states of the upper Midwest, the soldiers, the communities, uh, the civilians that were from our area. Did you find any difference within your research in the experience and attitude between Irish Catholic immigrants who ended up living in the upper Midwest, serving in upper Midwestern regiments versus those who might have lived in Eastern states and ended up serving more with the Army of the Potomac uh, in the Eastern field? So basically we have to be focused and grounded in the East. So I can't overwhelmingly tell you what the, what the reactions were in the Midwest. I have, I mean, I looked at um, Illinois units. I looked at Irish Americans in scattered units across the Midwest because I wanted to test that theory. I didn't find huge differences 
um, between what you're seeing in, say, New York, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania regiments, as opposed to Illinois regiments, if you want to, if you want to kind of think about it that way. But the reason I say it with an asterisk is this is another area where you're starting to see more and more explorations within the field. I would say certainly within the last decade or so, this, this push again to realize just how massive the immigrant population was in the upper Midwest. And that because they didn't tend to serve in these green flag units, these Irish units, for a long time, that was where we were exploring because we were, this is, this is where most of the data was that we could find. But as you start to be able to really crunch some of that data, as a lot of these rosters, pension files, muster rolls, as all of these things start to become almost digitally available, so you can really start to crunch some data, now is where you're starting to see the field explore more and more into these kind of non-immigrant, non-ethnic units. Um, and that's what's allowing us to get into some of these upper, upper Midwest communities that, again, folks like Ryan Keating, folks like Damian Shields are really getting into. And I love it because it was, it was, it was a weakness in my book that I couldn't, I couldn't cover everything. Um, and that was one of the areas that if, you know, I, I could do a volume two, uh, that's the way I would do it, you know, and it's, and it's, and it's great too, because you can't cluster these groups any more than you can, you can't cluster the Irish or even just Irish Catholics, right? Because it really depends on your economic stability. It depends on, you know, when you volunteer, is, is your community going to be able to take care of that family at home and make sure that they're taken care of? Or are they going to be totally alone? You know, what, what kind of, it, there's so many factors involved. So it's, it's great to be able to start to kind of diversify those explorations and get to a better sense of kind of why people served and what happened. Yeah, we, we have the same thing here when you think, well, soldiers from the upper Midwest, well, they all enlisted, are they all, the motivation behind enlisting or serving, well, of course they were all, you can fit them into this category because they're from Illinois. But then when you look at Northern Illinois versus Southern Illinois, vast differences in motivations yeah. in their political beliefs, uh, their economic situation. So it's, you cannot paint everyone with that wide brush. You can't. And, but again, I mean, that's the fun, right. Of, yeah. of studying history. And, and I mean, for military history, I like the, one of the reasons I find it so fascinating is because there's no middle ground. Once the war starts, you're, you're going to have to pick a side. You can't just kind of step back and say, we're just going to agree to disagree. And so it really forces people to, kind of rank their, their issues, right? And, and act on how, how those rankings fall into line. And yeah, it's a whole host of issues that's gonna decide your, your religion, your, your economic stability, your family connections. There's, there's so many factors that are gonna come into play. Yeah, you write in the, in the book that, that there was a real balancing act for these Irish immigrants, an old loyalty to Ireland and a new loyalty to their new home here in America. How did these dual loyalties play out and really influence the actions of the Irish Catholic volunteers? So for, for the groups I studied, the biggest thing I saw was that, and, you, and again, you see this in a lot of groups, this kind of early rush to arms, this, you know, the, what, the, what military historians refer to as kind of the rage militaire, right? Where there's just this early enthusiasm that you tend to see at the beginning of just about any war. And then, you know, as, as Thomas Paine once wrote, right? This, this, the summer soldiers start to fade <laughs> And you go into the hard winter of war, if you will. And as the war hardens, I think the, 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 the kind of not only immigrant and almost that kind of de somewhat detached and maybe a little bit suspicious experience and a kind of influence within the community, but also as Irish Americans and the feeling of being kind of prejudice, prejudiced against and targeted and tarnished so often within society, it, it, it shaped the reactions almost kind of suspiciously so that when the federal government would change policies that would hurt the Irish Catholic population in the U.S., you started to see these responses of, I told you so, they always do this. They're always willing to sacrifice us. So when you see high casualty rates and things like the 69th New York, in part, it's kind of because of the commander and it's also kind of because they're really good and they're in a really effective unit. So they're gonna get sent in to really difficult positions and, and situations, but it's also gonna be a situation where Irish communities at home are gonna be very quickly suspicious that once again, they're being sacrificed and they're gonna be expected to be sacrificed because they are not valued in this society. So that, that um, those frustrations are really gonna shape the responses that you're gonna see coming out of the communities and within, within the regiments themselves. So you saw a bit of a shift in 
the views of the war from these early Catholic, uh, Irish Catholic immigrants, soldiers, as the war progressed, battles like Fredericksburg, where the Irish Brigade suffered, and also the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation. Politically, you see that, and then the Irish response to that. Can you talk about that shift? And were there any other, within your research, any other specific incidences that you found that really shaped this change in attitude or uh, something else that you found kind of reoccurring? Like, wow, this, this letter really reinforces this attitude. I've seen this multiple times. Yeah. Um, probably, I mean, if you had to point to three kind of bam, bam, bam kind of events that really start to change attitudes, it's going to be high casualties at the Battle of Antietam, um, particularly for the Irish Brigade, but some of the other Irish units that are in the Army of the Potomac, um, the announcement of the Emancipation Proclamation five days later, and then the tremendous sacrifices that the Irish Brigade in particular, um, the casualties that they're going to suffer at the Battle of Fredericksburg. And it's going to be shortly kind of after Fredericksburg in the spring of 63, if you want one more, where Thomas Francis Mahar is basically going to be forced out um, and he's going to resign as commander of the Irish Brigade. So it's going to lead to a couple of things. Number one, the Emancipation Proclamation was viewed overwhelmingly, not entirely, but largely within the Irish Catholic community as a negative thing because there was the belief that formerly enslaved African-Americans are gonna come North and they're gonna quote unquote, take our jobs. Um, and so there was this tremendous fear. Irish Catholics were overwhelmingly Democrats. The Democratic party tended to be much more defensive and protective of um, the institution of slavery. And so, yeah, this was, this was not viewed as a good thing. This was certainly not viewed as in the Irish Catholic population as something worth fighting for. It was viewed also as kind of draining the focus away from saving the union. So there are those factors there. And then you also have to realize things like Fredericksburg was just such a bloodbath um, for much of the Army of the Potomac, but to, particularly in the positions on Marie's Heights where the Irish Brigade um, advanced that, you know, there, there's, there's a quote that comes out from one of the commanders at the time, one of the men, excuse me, that we're shot, we are slaughtered like sheep with no result but defeat. And this, this sense that, you know, it's, it's pointless. Uh, they, don't, they don't respect us. They don't value us. Um, you can see this. The Irish Catholic community would argue with the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, and, you know, this is just a disaster. Compounding that is the sense, too, that the Irish Catholic um, units, particularly the Irish Brigade, wanted to go home in the winter of 1862-63, to recruit replacements, they needed to. I mean, the, the unit was dwindling. They had suffered tremendous casualties in 1862 and this gets denied. Um, some other units were allowed to go home for recruiting in, in the spring of 63, but for the most part, universally that was being denied. The argument was we can't let too many units go home, but within the Irish Brigade, the suspicion is, well, I saw this other unit, they got to go home. And so we're not allowed to go home because again, we're Irish Catholics, we're gonna be sacrificed. So that, that period from September, 1862, really through about March of 1863, you have these growing suspicions. Mahar leaves the unit um, and there's the sense again that he wasn't valued either. And so he's resigning in protest. In fairness, he wasn't a particularly good commander. He's a fantastic politician. He sh I would have loved to see him stay home on recruiting duty. He could recruit anybody. He's, he's masterful speaker and politician. Um, but there's that suspicion, right? And then finally, of course, in March of 1863, you get the Enrollment Act, which is the federal draft. And when it was passed in Congress, a policy changed on immigration. Beforehand, Secretary of State William Seward had promised immigrants, there's promises made to consuls overseas, that as long as an immigrant has not declared their intent to become a citizen, they can't be drafted. Only citizens can be drafted, everything's fine. When the Enrollment Act got passed, if you had declared your intent to become a citizen, you could be drafted. And so these are those kind of broiling tensions that are gonna be kind of building in the spring of 1863 and why you're gonna to start to see an eruption of, of resistance and violence and things like the New York City draft riots in which Irish Catholics were no, by no means the, major, the only participants, but they're heavily involved in them. And it's, it, it's a reflection of these frustrations. Well, Susanna, thank you so much for joining us today and really giving us another look at this important immigrant community, uh, the, the vast number of 
reasons behind their service and what it really meant for them and their families. And I invite everyone out there to check out your book, The Harp and the Eagle. Um, and uh, we look forward to speaking with you again. I'm sure there might be other opportunities in the future. I would enjoy that. Thanks, Doug. Okay. Have a great day. Thank you so much. You too.